Welcome everybody who's joining us today. Um, welcome to the National Areas Association 2022 webinar series. I'm Maura McGinty Kloss and I am the Director of Programs and Communications. And I'm delighted that you're joining us today. The purpose of NAA webinars is not just to convey information, but to engage natural areas professionals on topics of interest that highlight emerging science methodologies and best practices. And I encourage you to participate in this webinar by posting comments and questions in the chat. And please know that we're gonna address as many as we can during Q&A. Also, if you are watching this webinar and you think of another topic that you would like to see um, as part of our program, please don't hesitate to let us know by emailing info at naturalareas.org. I wanna take a moment to thank our underwriter, our sponsor and partner, the US Forest Service. And they help us to provide a lot of the quality programming that we are able to share. So thank you to the Forest Service. And just a couple of minutes for those of you who are new to the Natural Areas Association. We are a national nonprofit organization. We serve practitioners who manage ecologically significant landscapes to protect biodiversity. Protecting natural areas in perpetuity requires quality science to inform practices and access to reliable resources. NAA provides science-based content for researchers, practitioners that's applied and practical and is geared towards knowledge transfer related to the management of natural areas. We share a suite of programs and products and services that offer a broad spectrum of current and emerging issues, methodologies, and best practices. And we try to provide it in a way that is convenient and accessible to busy practitioners. The purpose of our programs is designed to achieve on the ground outcomes. So we encourage your participation and sharing among each other. I also just want to remind people that the Natural Areas Association publishes the Natural Areas Journal. It comes out four times a year, January, April, July, January, April, July, and October, and July is now available and October is coming out anytime now. It's a peer reviewed journal and it's um, a great read, lots of great research and uh, applied science. Also coming up this month, we're hosting a virtual symposium called Nature's Frontline, the Role of Natural Areas and Climate Resilience in Central Appalachian Forests. It'll be held on Friday, the 28th of October from 11 to 4.45 p.m. Eastern time. The program will consider the role of natural areas as a critical strategic component to mitigating impacts of human caused climate disruption, examine the science and equip practitioners with the information needed to inform management plans, educate policymakers, and enlighten the public on the vital role that natural areas play in offsetting the impacts of climate change on our planet. We are excited to be featuring some highly respected uh, speakers in this area. Dr. Reed Noss, Dr. Mark Anderson, Dr. Christopher Williams, Abigail Weinberg, and Dr. Charles Lafon. And the symposium will be facilitated by a land management practitioner, Dr. Ryan Klopp of the Virginia Natural Heritage Program. You will not wanna miss this important discussion that will tackle head on one of the most critical issues of our time. So don't hesitate to go to our website, naturalareas.org to register. Also coming up in November is our State Natural Areas Program Roundtable, which will focus on forestry and wildlife management for the benefit of biodiversity. And we want to include your work. So if you have a case study that highlights collaborations between wildlife biologists and foresters in projects with outcomes across multiple taxa groups, we want to hear from you. Please email uh, at info at naturalareas.org before October 20th so you can let me know about your program. And we're excited to be launching a new lecture series, Innovators in Natural Areas Science, featuring Dr. Suzanne Samard, uh, author of The Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest. This program highlights innovators in natural areas science in order to communicate new scientific discoveries that contribute toward the protection of eco ecologically significant landscapes. And the goal is to share new and transformative research to directly with land management practitioners. The lecture is on December 1. It'll be hosted on Zoom and it'll be from noon to 2.30. Uh, along with the lecture, we will also have an opportunity for practitioners to engage with um, Dr. Samard in a fireside chat or interactive panel. 
And now let's turn to today's program, Collaborating to Conserve Crop Wild Relatives. Our speaker today, Dr. Ann Francis, is a botanist with the USDA ARS National Germplasm Resources Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland, where she develops and implements projects that conserve plant genetic resources. Her research interests include crop wild relatives, ethnobotany, native plant conservation, and restoration ecology. Previously, she served as NatureServe's lead botanist for almost 11 years, where she focused on conserving rare plants in the United States and Canada. She currently serves as the North America Plant Red List Authority and has collaborated on many conservation status assessment projects, including tri tri Trillium U.S. Trees and the Global Cactus Assessment. Anne worked as a field botanist for the Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden and the Institute for Regional Conservation in Florida and conducted field work in Costa Rica. She's a native of Miami, Florida with educational degrees from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a, B, uh, a master's from Florida International University and a PhD from the University of Florida. So Anne, I will let you take it from here. Wonderful, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really, really pleased to be here um, uh, sharing a little bit about crop wild relatives. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, it says this will stop other screen sharing, yes. Um, and um, I wanted to let folks know that my internet has been a little bit wonky. So if um, I stop sharing my video, um, that's the reason why it's to conserve bandwidth. So, um, great. So with that, I'll, I'll get started. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, in addition to all of the other long names about where I work, the USDA Agricultural Research Service and the National Germplasm Resources Laboratory, specifically I work in the Plant Exchange Office. And I wanted to acknowledge Karen Williams, who is a, a panelist, um, on this talk today and may be able to answer some questions later in the Q&A. Uh, but I've been at USDA for a little bit over a year and I've learned a tremendous amount from Karen in that time. And um, she actually uh, put together a lot of the material that you'll see in the slideshow today. Um, so I wanted to uh, go ahead and acknowledge Karen before I got started. So for today's talk, I'm going to start with a background on crop wild relatives, uh, a little bit about what they are and why they're important. I'll then move on to focusing on crop wild relatives of the United States. We'll talk about conservation approaches, including ex situ and in, in situ, and we'll end with a discussion on opportunities for collaboration. One of the reasons I was so pleased to accept this invitation was because um, in the USDA and in our group, we just uh, submitted a five-year plan, kind of like a strategic plan. And one of our uh, important goals within these five years is to increase collaborations um, for X, uh, for well, both XC2 and NC2 conservation of crop wild relatives, but in particular, uh, focusing on NC2. And that is going to require a lot of uh, collaboration um, with federal agencies and um, a lot of other um, natural area land managers. So I'm really looking forward to that discussion at the end. So what are crop wild relatives? Simply stated, they're just the wild, naturally occurring plant taxa that are closely related to crop species. They're either the direct ancestors of crops or other closely related taxa. And if you wanted a more academic definition, you could look to Maxed et al. 2006, where they say a crop wild relative is a wild plant taxon that has an indirect use derived from its relatively close genetic relation to, relationship to a crop. Now, some people like to call crop wild relatives crops crazy cousins. And if that is easier to remember, I certainly welcome you to, um, to use that phrase as well. So obviously they are important to agriculture, um, but the ability to use them is dependent on their being conserved and available. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the use of crop wild relatives has steadily increased over the past decades. Um, and that's 
that's because they provide a, a lot of key traits that are important for agriculture, including pest and disease resistance, increased yield and increased quality, uh, tolerance to abiotic stresses, et cetera. And uh, technology and um, in, in breeding in recent years has led to um, increased use of crop wild relatives as well. So one example of a U.S. crop wild relative used for um, salinity tolerance is the Pico sunflower, Helianthus paradoxus, which you see in the bottom left. And it's used um, to confer that salinity tolerance into the cultivated sunflower, Helianthus annuus. This is a very uh, big chart with lots and lots of letters and words. We're obviously not going to go through it, uh, but it's basically a chart of U.S. Uh, crop wild relatives and their agronomic uses and traits. So as you quickly look through this, you may see some species that you are familiar with, um, and you may see that they are used for, um, for, for different traits as a crop wild relative that you may not have been um, familiar with before. So when talking about um, crop wild relatives, it's important to understand the plant breeders concept. And, and that's because this is how uh, crop wild relatives are prioritized for importance in the agricultural community. So the standard concept that's used is the Harlan and DeWitt gene pool classification. It puts uh, crop wild relatives into three basic categories. Um, there's the primary gene pool, which includes the crop species. Um, it can also include wild populations of that crop species. The secondary gene pool um, includes other species that are closely related and that can cross with the crop, but sometimes with some difficulty. And the um, tertiary gene pool include species that can be crossed with a crop species, but oftentimes need radical techniques or more than just what's used in um, conventional breeding. In addition to the gene pool concept, um, it's important to consider species that are used uh, for graft stock and root stock. So in this example, I'm trying to find my laser pointer here. Uh, here we go. So in this example, th this is a picture from a, a pamphlet about grape rootstocks for Michigan. And so th this is a grapevine growing here. And on the um, bottom, you see the rootstock um, that's used. Here in the middle is where the graft takes place. And on the top is the scion. And, and it's a cultivated um, grape of Cabernet Franc. So, um, so in this one, plant, um, we actually have at least three species. We have this Vitus vinifera, which is um, not native to the United States. It's the cultivated grapevine. But on the bottom in this rootstock, we have, um, it's the SO4 rootstock. And I just learned this as I was putting my talk together. Um, SO4 stands for Selection Oppenheim 4. Um, it's a hybrid of two native species, Vitus riparia and Vitus berlandieri but it was created at the Viticulture School of Oppenheim, Germany in 1904. So the world of, um, of, of grapes um, and all of the species and crop wild relatives involved um, is, is um, pretty remarkable. It was eye-opening to me as I learned about it. Here in this map, um, this is from a book chapter written by Claire Heinitz et al. on the crop wild relatives of um, grape, Vitus vinifera, and on the, what we're looking at here are two, two maps of the model distributions of native Vitus or grape species to North America, and on the left side we have this, um, we have species that are used as rootstock. These are model potential distributions, as I said, and that Berlandi area that we saw before is essentially this Helleri. And um, you see that um, down here, this is where it occurs. And Vitus riparia, many of you are probably familiar with, quite a widespread um, species and quite common. Um, that is the other species used in that rootstock. 
This second map shows the Vita species um, important as crop wild relatives for breeding into the scion or the top part of the grapevine. Um, and you can see where they're distributed. So now we're going to move into focusing on crop wild relatives of the United States. Um, I wanted to mention that the last decade has really seen increased attention brought to crop wild relatives in general um, and also in the United States as well. So um, this map shows the number of priority crop wild relatives per world region. And the U.S., which has sometimes been overlooked as an important contributor to crop wild relatives, is here seen in the third tier of importance with between 140 and 180 um, uh, species of priority crop wild relatives. So which crop wild relatives are in our backyard? Many of these you um, are familiar with, I'm sure. Um, and there, there are many, many more species than this. These are just a few examples. Um, some were domesticated before European contact, and they include the sunflower and the pepo squash. Some more recently domesticated species include blueberry and cranberry, both in the genus Vaccinium, um, blackberry, and pecan. Um, and we also have um, congenerics of domesticated species here, um, some of them quite important. Uh, oftentimes, the domesticated species is not native to the U.S., but we have lots of native species in um, general, like Prunus and Vitus, for example, and some native species of Malus that are important both for their um, breeding potential and, as I mentioned before, um, rootstock. An important uh, um, factor in figuring out which crop wild relatives we have here in the US, um, and not factor advancement rather, um, was an inventory that was published in 2013 by Colin Curry et al. And it was the first inventory of crop wild relatives of the, of the United States, although of course we've known a lot about them um, before then. This inventory um, really cast a wide net looking at both crop wild relatives and wild utilized taxa. Um, wild utilized taxa are those used directly for food, fiber, forage, medicine, ornamental, and restoration purposes. The inventory included um, native and naturalized species, and that wide net um, resulted in looking at 4,600 taxa. Um, of those, about 285 were identified as high priority to collect. So a look at the numbers that came out of this inventory. Um, you can see that for both wild utilized taxa and crop wild relatives, um, there are lots and lots of species in taxa. They make up greater than 20% of our uh, vascular plant taxa easily, depending on which numbers you look at. Um, and the families with a lot of crop wild relatives in the United States, you probably recognize from either being um, associated with crops and or families that have high richness in the U.S. And they include the bean family, grass family, um, asters or daisies, roses, amaranth, and heath. The inventory allowed us also to take a closer look at the conservation status of these crop wild relatives. And um, this is a, uh, this graph here is adapted from that inventory. You can see the good news. Sorry, I need to back up a step and say that the way that we did this was we matched the list of species to nature serves um, conservation status assessments. And we used the global rank or the G rank um, to determine the conservation status. And so here we're looking at um, G5 and G4. These are globally um, secure or apparently secure, equivalent to least concern in the red list. And then here, as we look at the G1 and G2s, these are the ones that are critically imperiled or imperiled. Um, and that was about 6% of the list of crop wild relatives we looked at. There was another 10% that fell into the G3 category or vulnerable. Um, so we do have some species we need to pay attention to, but overall crop wild relatives are less imperiled than the flora as a whole. Usually when we look at the flora as a whole, we're talking about 30% of species um, in this um, kind of 
G1, G2, G3 range. Um, and in this case, it's, it's lower. This could be because a lot of crop wild relatives are very widespread and common species. Um, I did want to mention that of the 23 that are G1, G2 are critically imperiled or imperiled, only eight of them are listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. So um, it is important to pay attention to these species, um, whether or not they have official protection. So moving on to another important advancement for crop wild relatives of the U.S. and North America. Um, a couple of years ago, a two volume book was published. Um, the first book focused on conservation strategies and the next one on important species. And so this really laid the the, the groundwork for um, documenting the, the wealth of crop wild relatives we have, identifying some conservation gaps, and identifying some ways to address those gaps. Um, I was lucky to co-author one of the chapters um, in, the vo in volume one of the book, and I bring it up here today because we looked specifically at the conservation status and threat assessments um, for the North American crop wild relatives with a focus on the US. And I know it's very difficult to see everything um, in this graph, but basically these are the most uh, frequently um, occurring threats to the to crop wild relatives as compared with, and those are the, the light bars, um, as compared with um, about uh, over 2000 rare US species. Um, so what's notable about this is that the frequency of the most common threats affecting the crop wild relatives is different from the frequency affecting um, rare plants as a whole. Um, so for example, housing in urban areas affect about 23% of all U.S. taxa, but 33% of crop wild relatives. Um, So finally, one other publication I, I wanted to bring up here um, is this one um, that was published in 2020, where uh, it's clear that crop wild relatives of the United States require urgent conservation action. Um, I wanted to bring up a quote from this because it's one of the more compelling ones, I think, for why we need to conserve crop wild relatives. And it says that these taxa are of urgent conservation priority and their wild genetic resources of cereal, fiber, fruit, nut oil, pulse, root tuber, spice sugar, and vegetable crops that collectively generate more than 116 billion in annual U.S. agricultural production value. So um, it's not just food security, it's not just conservation, um, it, there, it, there is a significant dollar amount attached to these crops that are dependent on the wild relatives. This paper was really, uh, I don't want to say the culmination, it represented probably a decade of work uh, largely led by Colin Quarry. Um, and more than having fancy quotes, um, it has um, a lot of really, really important and useful data, especially for land managers. So I wanted to go over that just a little bit. This paper, um, we took a, a lot of the information that we already had on crop wild relatives. In addition to that, we collected um, locality information from herbarium specimens and from gene banks and other germplasm collections. Um, and we took all that and we updated and prioritized that, that inventory from 2013. So we started with 4,600 taxa from the initial inventory. We actually widened the geographic scope. From there, we created three categories of priority. And priority um, in number one, that those are the priority um, and important species for crops and crop wild relatives. Um, and then two and three are for um, less important crops and for restoration or other purposes. Um, that uh, priority group um, consisted of 821 taxa. And from there, we broke the priority group up further Priority group 1A has the primary and secondary gene pool that we spoke about earlier and also graph stop, graph stock. So in this group of priority 1A, 1B, and 1C, um, that's about 600 taxa. That's what we used for analysis. Um, but we do recognize that the 285 taxa in priority category 1A are 
are the ones that we need to focus on for conservation. One of the cool things that having all this data enabled us to do was to produce this hotspot map um, of predicted taxonomic richness. This is again based on, on model distributions. And what's interesting to it, um, what's interesting about it for me is that it does not necessarily track, track with richness maps that you see of the US flora in general. In um, US richness and, and plant diversity in general, you see um, high numbers of species in um, California, Texas, Florida, um, spots in the Southeast, the Appalachians, et cetera, but you don't necessarily see this hot spot of diversity um, in this Northern swath here. Um, so I'm not, not exactly sure what contributed to that. I have some theories, but I wanna look into it a little bit more. Another important thing that this paper did was um, a conservation gap analysis. Um, this is too much to take in right now, but essentially what the paper did was look at um, conservation scores, both for um, in C2 and ex C2, um, and then um, combine them together for a mean. And um, these uh, bars indicate uh, the proportion of taxa that were either in high priority, um, medium priority, or low priority for conservation. Um, so interestingly here for NC2, um, there are some species that have a high priority need for conservation, but overall it's actually doing better than, than, than XC2. Um, in any case, lots of work still to be done. Um, the paper has, uh, again, as I said, a uh, treasure trove of data. Um, you can actually get um, species, list of species, um, and the natural areas. Um, I shouldn't say natural areas, protected areas they occur in. These incur include things like national parks and national wildlife areas, but not multi-use areas, um, if you're interested. Um, so you can get um, the available data through the the paper itself through the supplementary materials. It's also on Dataverse. Um, you can contact me and I can walk you through how to do some custom downloads. Um, but one thing that we did, uh, which is really cool, is we collaborated with PDI Partners for Data Innovation to create an interactive map of the crop wild relatives of the US based on data from this paper. So here, Again, I know it's a little bit hard to see, but I've mapped the occurrences of Caria floridana. Um, the gray circles represent herbarium specimens. Um, if there were um, germplasm um, uh, accessions that we had found, they would be here in purple. And what I've done is I've turned on the protected areas layer so that you can see where the species occurs in relation to protected areas. There's lots of other stuff you can do. You can map up to 15 species at a time. You can download the data that you map. Um, so I encourage you to, to check it out. Okay, um, continuing on our, our whirlwind overview of crop wilds relatives, I wanted to move on to conservation approaches. Um, I stole this little graphic from an article on genetic resources um, for tomato, um, but what was interesting to it about me, uh, interesting, <laughs> what was interesting about it to me, rather, is that um, it um, talks about all of the ways that uh, species are conserved XC2, and for me, brings home the, the point of how important XC2 collections are for the use of crop wilds relatives. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So building on this um, momentum for crop wild relatives in the United States, um, there were a few papers that came out um, establishing a roadmap for how to conserve US crop wild relatives. Um, one of those papers was actually published in the Natural Areas Journal um, by Corey et al. in 2020. Um, but they all basically have the same five uh, main steps for this roadmap. The first is to document and assess North America's crop wild relatives and wild utilized plants. The second is to protect the species in their natural habitats in C2. Um, the third is to uh, collect and conserve um, in XC2 collections, the diversity of prioritized species. Um, it's important to make these accessible for plant breeding, research, and education. And finally, of course, to um, raise awareness. 
So this road, the roadmap that I just showed provides a model for how we can um, advance conservation for crop wild relatives as a whole, but also for specific crops. And um, there's a, a paper came out on um, conserving berries in Canada following this model. And we're planning to use this model as well um, with our work on grapes that I've been focusing on lately. So another important um, uh, another important guideline for conserving crop wild relatives is uh, the joint strategic framework that uh, the Forest Service and USDA ARS um, put out together in 2014. In both of these, um, in the roadmap and in the in the joint framework, as well as many, many other papers um, that you'll see on crop wild relatives, there's a, a stress on um, complementary conservation. It's also called integrated conservation. And this is basically the idea that we are doing both in situ and ex situ conservation, and we're linking them explicitly um, in a holistic way so that uh, we can really make sure that the species is is um, conserved um, and usable. So first we'll talk a little bit about ex situ conservation. Um, you know, here in this slide, these are just a few examples that are listed. Um, there are federal programs, um, state programs, non-governmental programs. There's also university, private industry. Um, there are um, lots of ex situ collections out there. Um, they are, again, really important um, for being able to um, use the crop wild relatives and study them. Um, and um, yes, to use them and study them. And it's, it's important that we um, have um, backup and duplication um, for, for these collections. That said, I did want to mention the National Plant Germ in the system, which is part of the USDA, um, which has as part of its mandate to make sure that these genetic resources are conserved and usable. Um, the, there are several national plant germplasm sites around the country. Um, the main seed lab that some of you are probably familiar with is the National Center for Genetic Resources Preservation in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, but overall, we have um, close to 600,000 accessions, over 15,000 species, and um, and these are distributed um, around the world to, to researchers. One reason why the NPGS system is so important, um, it's also known to be one of the best in the world, um, is all of the associated um, data and cataloging and accessioning that goes along um, with all of the accessions. Um, we can use our own data um, to look at uh, conservation gaps um, and, you know, looking again at that priority 1A species group, we can see that within the NPGS, 73% of those are already represented XD2, which is great. Um, uh, and we have over 4,500 accessions from that priority group as well. So um, we're not starting from nothing, but we still have some more work to do to make sure these collections are complete. One of the ways that we fill gaps in the NPGS um, is through a plant exploration program that we run out of the plant exchange office. And um, this program has been going on for many, many years. We did slow down or almost stop explorations during the pandemic, but we're hoping to get back up now that travel is reopening. Um, we also work with BLM Seeds of Success that a lot of you are probably familiar with. Um, they collect native plant materials for restoration. The seeds, are, though, are incorporated into the National Plant Germplasm System. Um, and of course, the BLM Seeds of Success is not focused on crop wild relatives. However, there is uh, quite an overlap among the species. And um, if you wanted to read more, Stephanie Green and others um, wrote a, a paper on it, on these collateral benefits. Okay, we're gonna quickly move into um, in situ conservation of crop wild relatives. Um, we all, you know, speaking to Natural Areas Association, we know the importance of in situ conservation. From a USDA perspective, it's where we have probably focused the least amount of our, our resources um, up till today. 
Um, so there's a critical need to identify priority species and areas for conservation. We need to maintain strong links between the NC2 and XD2 um, conservation programs. And it's important to note that NC2 conservation is sometimes the only option for conserving some crop wild relatives that are challenging to store and to regenerate. So crop wild relatives, of course, as any wild plants occur on lands um, uh, with diverse management by different agencies, um, almost 30% of land in the US is federally owned and that can help us a lot with partnerships in the West. However, um, most of the land in the central and Eastern US are non-federal and these are the collaborations that are especially important to make in terms of conserving crop wild relatives. In the Forest Service and USDA that I mentioned before actually uh, outlined two approaches. Um, one is called the specific crop approach. Um, and um, it's when we focus on one crop and we find um, populations that are important for its conservation. And those are designated as in situ genetic resource reserves. The other approach is called the protected area approach where we find an area that's rich in a number of different crop wild re relatives um, and that area is designated as um, an IGRR. So I'm going to give you three, quickly, three examples of um, the specific crop approach that have been used. Um, the first is on the complementary conservation of wild cranberry, and this is work that Karen was very much involved with and happened before I started at ARS. Um, but in order to conserve the range of genetic variation in wild cranberry species, um, this joint project was undertaken um, and um, genetic diversity was uh, analyzed using microsatellite markers, um, all of this to identify um, the populations that would uh, be the best in C2 reserves. So these are all of the populations that were evaluated on national forests. Um, two different vaccinium species were looked at. And if you're interested in learning more, there was a paper that came out um, on this project. The other example I wanted to mention was on um, selecting in situ conservation sites for grape genetic resources. This was work done over 20 years ago by Diane Pavek when she was at a postdoc at the um, at the National Germplasm Resources Laboratory. Uh, and she um, and, and her colleagues did a pretty in-depth study on Vitus rupestris, which you see here, the rock grape, which is uh, a G3 actually vulnerable. And the final example I wanted to bring up about this specific um, crop approach is the wild chili botanical area that some of you may have heard of. Um, it is in the Coronado National Forest. Um, it represents the northernmost range of the Chiltepin um, pepper, um, capsicum annuum, um, variety glabrusculum, and um, it is uh, a, the wild ancestor of many cultivated peppers. Um, it's supposed to actually be really, really, really hot. Um, so I have some Chiltepins, but I haven't cooked with them before, so maybe I should try it out. Okay. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the protected area approach to my knowledge, and maybe Karen can, can chime in later. Um, I have not seen uh, so many examples of this protected area approach um, that, you know, identifying uh, an area that's a hot spot um, with lots of crop wild relatives. Um, it would be great to look at areas that are already protected and may harbor some unique diversity to see if they can be designated as IGRRs as well. So to, um, to wrap up my talk for today, because um, I've covered the, both the NC2 and XC2 uh, conservation approaches, um, I just wanted to give a few points here about what success would look like for conserving crop wild relatives in the US. Um, so I think the first measure would be that we have comprehensive, easily accessible information on crop wild relatives, their distributions, occurrences, and conservation status. So the work that was published a couple of years ago um, gets us really far in that. But of course, there's always more um, information that's needed and more fine tuning that's needed. Um, the second point would be a broad diversity of crop wild relatives secured in C2 and XC2. 
Um, the third, that the germplasm is readily available to the global community of plant breeders and scientists. Um, that we're conducting cross-agency research with mutual benefits. And finally, and most importantly for this talk, that we have coordination and partnerships between land management and food security agencies to support both in situ and ex situ conservation. So um, in conclusion, um, I'll just say that um, I, I hope by now um, you realize that conserving crop Crop wild relatives is essential to maintaining our food security globally. Um, the U.S. does house important and diverse crop wild relatives, um, many of which are poorly conserved. Um, that the new information that we are um, developing um, from different analyses um, will that that documents um, and helps us to understand crop wild relatives will facilitate their conservation. Um, Linking in situ and ex situ conservation, it provides a comprehensive and integrated approach to safeguarding crop wild relatives. And finally, um, that collaborations hold the key to our success. Um, so I know I took you on quite a whirlwind. Um, I can't seem to advance my slide um, of crop wild relatives today. Um, but I, I really do um, want to leave a little bit of time at the end, um, in addition to questions to uh, a discussion about collaborations that um, that we may have. Um, I'd be interested in hearing if you manage uh, uh, land where there are crop wild relatives, um, where you'd be interested in designating um, an NC2 genetic resource reserve, um, that sort of thing. So with that, I will open it up. Hey, thank you, Anne. That was definitely a whirlwind tour. Um, uh, somebody wants to know, what is the picture that you're concluding with? Ah, um, this is, so I did, I didn't mention this, but um, I, even though I've only been with the USDA a year, I've long been interested in crop wild relatives. And for my master's, um, I focused on ethnobotany and I lived with an indigenous group in Costa Rica. And so this was um, uh, my, one of my host family members um, um, pounding rice in the in the pilon oh. in the yard. Yeah. Oh, great picture. Yeah. So um, we do have a couple of questions. And um, also we are, even though we're in webinar, um, I do believe that you can um, raise your hand or some indicate, yes, raise your hand if you did want to, Anne had asked the question about, um, she wanted to hear from you regarding collaboration. If you raise your hand, I can allow you to talk. It's kind of Zoom has come a long way since uh, we first all went into COVID. So, um, you know, let me know if you want to speak, we'd be happy to, to recognize you. Um, are there any crops with toxic wild relatives? Ooh, any crops with toxic wild relatives? I'm sure there are. Um, I just have to think about it. Um, and toxic to who? Um, humans, wildlife. Um, um, that's an excellent question. I'm going to think about it. And I'm sure the answer is yes, but um, I would, yeah. <laughs> So, so Suzanne, you um, posted that question. If you wanted to provide a little more uh, detail on what you wanted to know, be happy to uh, to repose it. Um, do you know, of, uh, are there any examples of where wild crop relative work is being implemented on designated natural areas uh, in the country? Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, for on forest service land, for sure. Um, right, the the three examples that I mentioned, um, I'm sure that there are um, other examples. Um, I don't know, Karen. Do you can you think of any um, offhand? Um, um, no, I'm thinking. I mean, as you said, the Forest Service is really looking a lot at crop wild relatives on their lands, and a lot of individual groups are not land managers necessarily, but botanic gardens and all are looking at crop wild relatives, but not necessarily related to specific areas or designation of mm -hmm. specific protected areas. Also, you could, well, part of your conclusion was collaboration is key. So 
how as land management practitioners, I mean, we have a lot of responsibilities, we're doing a lot of different things, but how, how, who can we collaborate with? Are there collaborations that exist? How, how if you wanted to uh, be a great part of this effort, could you get involved? Um, I think probably the easiest way to start out is just to, to email me and we can go from there. I mean, I know, I, you know, I should back up and say um, uh, the rock grape, for example, um, is a, it's vulnerable. It's a G3, but it is um, considered um, imperiled or critically imperiled in a number of states. And so I know in Pennsylvania, for example, they are regularly monitoring the rock grape populations there that I believe are on state lands. Um, and, you know, I just know this because I've taken an interest in, in the species and I just reached out to Steve Grundin and asked, you know, what the situation was. That was one of the pictures in the title slide. But I don't I think, to my knowledge, there's a sort of repository or database you know, listing these are the natural areas with the crop wild relatives, and this is how they're being managed. Um, I think I'd I'd love to to create that. Um, I don't quite know how or what that would look like, but I think the first um, thanks, Steve. I didn't even know you were on. Um, uh, you know, uh, I I wouldn't know how to approach um, gathering that data, but I I'd, I'd love to just start to gather it and see where it goes. Oh, wonderful. Um, Does anybody else have any questions while we're, or if, um, I, we, would, we went through things very, very quickly. Um, you know, and uh, is there any place in your presentation where um, if you had more time, you would have told us a little more? Uh, what is, what's an area where um, that might, you know, impact those of us in natural areas more than, you know, some of the other stuff. Um, I, I think that there is uh, an opportunity to create the one to recreate or take the wonderful example um, and framework that has been put forth by Forest Service and USGA and see how it can be um, modified to use for other uh, other folks who are interested. I think the other thing I wanted to say is that. There, there is a lot of overlap between crop wild relative and wild utilized species. Um, and I think in both of those, there's an opportunity for interpretation in natural areas, if that's possible. I think people, the general public are um, often interested in, you know, what are the plant species that were used to domesticate grapes or squash or sunflowers or whatever and and to know that some of them are right here in their own backyard i think people are also really interested in what species are you know utilized um just as they are in the wild so i think there's an opportunity for for collaboration there um i just i wanted to say one more thing which is that i didn't realize that the the question about the toxic wild relatives was from suzanne copter who is a committee member um on my master's degree so hi suzanne i will get back to you with an answer <laughs> <laughs> well that are, that that does take care of the the questions that we do have from um the audience today i just wanted to remind everybody that we will be sending out an email that will have a link to this recording and we will also have links to all of the resources that ann mentioned today so um, if you missed them or couldn't read the slide or whatever, we will be sending those as out to you. So, well, Anne, thank you so much for taking the time to, to spend with us today. This has been a fascinating topic. I know something I knew very little about and really appreciated all that you were able to share today and some great resources. So thank you. It's my pleasure. And I'm available anytime for questions or if anyone wants to reach out. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And we appreciate you joining us today. And we hope we see you again tomorrow for Elizabeth Fox presentation. Thank you. Bye bye.